All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you take your uh, take your seats, I hope uh, that you can hear my voice. I know it's been uh, slightly, perhaps, difficult during the day. Uh, and now we have the reactor vendor panel that we have been uh, waiting for in Finland for uh, for quite some uh, quite some time. Uh, I I think I've discussed with many of you already uh, yesterday and, and today as well that one of the main points of this seminar, I believe, is is education to get an overall view and a feel for the industry that where are we at the moment and what is going to be feasible uh, feasible in the future. But before we actually go into the panel, let me uh, introduce myself to the, those of you that uh, don't know me, not that many of you in the audience. I'm Tom Huttonen from uh, Finnish Energy. I'm a nuclear lobbyist by profession and a nuclear engineer uh, by heart. So uh, let us begin, and I think uh, what we've learned today already, I, I don't want to jump into the conclusions before we even start, is that it seems that our preconception in the media for this event was that, okay, it's maybe in the 2030s, 2040s that we can build SMRs in Finland, and uh, this seems to be uh, this notion has been challenged today. And let us uh, dig a little bit deeper into the subject today. But uh, to start off the reactor panel, and, and you know all, the, all of the uh, uh, panelists already, so we can skip the introduction introduction because we are slightly behind schedule. Uh, but to start off the discussion is that. We have discussed the entire day, of course, about SMRs, not so much about large reactors, which, of course, which is not the topic of, of today. But for all of the panelists, uh, a question that, how do you see the market, small modular reactors uh, versus large reactors in a, in a global uh, perspective? In, in Finland, we are building large ones, and, and large ones are being built uh, globally as well. and, and and to sort of make the point that are you competing with the large ones or do you think that they're supplementing one another or, or something else? So, please, uh, <coughs> ladies first, Link, I think you can, uh, <laughs> can start. Uh, so in my presentation I did make a few comparisons between new skills design and the large reactors. Um, but I think what's important there, it's not really to uh, compare and contrast from a business point of view, but more from the technology point of view, so that so most people have the understanding of large reactors, especially here, because there are some large reactors operating in Finland, but more to make that educational assessment. Um, we don't see ourselves as competing with large reactors because the energy market is very big, and there are different applications for different types of energy technologies. Um, so 80% of the world's energy demand still comes from fossil fuels today. So there is a lot to replace um, if we're going to move towards a carbon-free world. And so we see our main competitors, especially in the U.S., with the price targets that we're trying to hit as natural gas. They're our main competitor in the U.S. And internationally, that's different, dependent, dependent on the country and what the energy prices are there. But we don't really see it as a technology versus technology competition, but more on, on the level of price. What can the technology be deployed at? OK, so basically, it's country dependent in a sense that uh, what is the main main effort? OK, uh, Mr. Chun or Chan? Chan. Uh, almost. Uh, what are your comments on yes. the Large versus small. Yes, yes. I, I think I think a small modular reactor is not competitor with large nuclear power plant. I, I think uh, the, each, the they they have their own advantages. So the we are, small modular reactor has a the low capital cost and the enhanced safety feature. But they are, on the other hand, the large nuclear power plant has a lot of many experience for operation. So and they are. Uh, and they have the the cheap the the cost for per unit power. So each country uh, will choose their own the nuclear power plant based on the, their situation. For example, Korea. The Korea is very small land area, and they we have very good the electrical grid. So it is very advantageous to constructs a small number of large nuclear power plant and to distribute electricity from them to all over country. But the, some, some countries have, some countries have the, the small 
population density at their various location. They, uh, it is the uh, advantage also to, to construct the small modular in the various inside. And the, <coughs> we, uh, the small modular reactor can have to the, find the new market, I think. So there are many old uh, core uh, fired uh, power plant mm. in the world. So uh, they, uh, most of them are less than uh, 300 megawatt electric. So the, they can be repressed by, I think, uh, small modular reactor. It's a very good market. And uh, the, we are, as we are talked about, discussed about <coughs> that, uh, the small modular reactor is very suitable for the application, other application besides uh, electric generation. So there are, I think there are many countries which need the application of this heating mm -hmm. or desalination. Uh, so I think the, those market is very good for the SMR. Okay. So we have a lot of work, 80% uh, fossil, and, uh, yeah. and we have the applications. Do you care to uh, to add something? I think uh, link a, a little bit, you know, empty the coffin there a little bit on uh, on, the, on that question. But can I? Yeah, I think I think she covered it all very well. I have very little to add to that, but maybe I can give it a little bit of context. Uh, so uh, our company is developing uh, a high temperature system. It's a small. Uh, it's, a, it's designed to be as in the in the small modular reactor range. Uh, so uh, we would, for example, have no business competing with micro reactors, right? Because we we would not be able to uh, build in that range competitively, cost competitively. So um, and then, you know, a, a a low temperature system wouldn't necessarily want to compete with with us on, in a high temperature application because. Yeah. We have a naturally. So the uh, application is different. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. So there are different. Yeah. Different applications where, where different technologies would not necessarily overlap, uh, on an application basis. Okay. All right. You had a you had a yeah, on There that. is one additional point that I would like to make, which is the development of the rest of the energy system, and especially mm -hmm. the renewables circles, which are also quite prevalent in the universities these days. There is a lot of talk about decentralization of electricity mm. generation. And uh, I think that these very small reactors, small reactors and, and micro reactors might fit that bill also. So they would be compatible with the, 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 that type of an energy system. Although I, I don't share their enthusiasm or, or, or their expectation that everything will go down to very, very small level. I, I think that we benefit quite a lot from these well-working national grids, as we're pointed out by Korea colleagues, and what we have also, and this capability of transferring large quantities of power around the country. So, so I, I see that there is plenty of market for all of these technologies that have been talked about. And, and it, it, it just remains for us to fulfill the promises better than previous generations have been able to in our business. Okay. All right. Uh, I think that uh, that's pretty much what I had in mind, but I didn't want to uh, say it, you know, before uh, before the panelists uh, concluded that. But how about the if we think about constructing new nuclear, be it be it small or actually be it large, I've uh, identified that you need sort of three pillars that you can rely on. Is first is economics. It needs to be economically uh, feasible. Second is, of course, techno uh, technological uh, pillar and, and, and safety. It needs to work, you know. Uh, and third is the, the political or social pillar that you need to get the uh, you know, acceptance. If we want to sort of divide this now into these three categories and to identify the key challenges that you identify in, in the market, be it te uh, technological challenge or economic or, or uh, political. So, do you want to, uh, Trost, do you want to uh, start off? Yeah, I can start on that. I think that the, one of the major things we face is, is uh, licensing issues uh, because every new market has to be, uh, it's a new license 
okay. uh, and that means new uh, forking out uh, new money for uh, let's say getting an uh, approved uh, for work basically. Okay. Um, and obviously that market has to be uh, of a size uh, to us that it means that we can make a return on that investment uh, in, okay. in the longer run. Uh, so obviously, uh, if we can create a larger, say, a, a European regulator or something, it would be a lot better for these small, uh, okay. small modular reactors. All right. So, so you identify, identify licensing uh, and uh, mentioned the European Common Regulator, which, from a lobbyist point of view, I might, uh, I don't want to sound too pessimistic, but it, it might be a pipe dream, <laughs> or at least uh, takes a lo long time to achieve something similar that we have in the aviation industry. Since everybody understands that it's 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 a good idea to have a common license for airplanes because everybody wants to fly, but uh, unfortunately not everybody sees the light of nuclear in, in Europe, be it Germany or, or Austria or, or somebody else. It makes it a little bit more difficult. But let's uh, go into the licensing uh, uh, question a little bit a uh, little bit later. But concerning these, uh, let's say social. Uh, challenges that you are facing. So, what do you identify as as the key social uh, challenges? Or are there now? <laughs> well, you just. I think you just made the point in saying that people there's an international licensing regime for airplanes because everyone wants to fly, and so it comes down to the people and the social license and. I, so I studied nuclear engineering and I ended up going into the business and communication side of nuclear because I saw that's where the bigger issues were. We can engineer the perfect design. I think the technology barriers are solvable with engineering. Even the licensing perceived barriers are solvable with engineering as you've seen with the success of our licensing process or near success, I won't jinx it just yet. Um, but the communication barriers, I think, are harder to solve, especially in an engineering and technically focused community, because you have to start to deal much more with emotions and the fear that people have, which can be more difficult to deal with, and the solutions aren't necessarily as straightforward. And once, if you do have a social license and public ex acceptance, then the licensing issues almost fall into place, because as soon as you have the public calling for something, there will be, the utilities will listen to that and the government will listen to that. Um, our, even our funding, it comes from uh, programs that are uh, designed by Congress. So Congress allows the Department of Energy to give us funding to then go have that funding to go through the licensing process and people vote in Congress. So often I think we forget just how important the communication and the public aspect is. And so I echo what Cannon said earlier today and that what you can do is keep contributing to um, grassroots organizations, and we have Generation Atomic and uh, Eco-Modernist Society here, so if you keep doing that and there's more talks about it, I think that will help with some of these other barriers. Okay, Johanny had uh, something to add. Yeah, uh, yes, uh, people are quite open to new ideas if they see that there is a benefit to them, okay, and they are averse to ideas which benefit somebody else. So, so uh, any project where you can go to people in some place, not your hometown, but, but somewhere else in the country, and, and explain that, okay, this is what we plan to do, and this is all the good things that are going to come out of this for you. Uh, the, the, the reception is likely to be uh, rather favorable. Yeah. And then they will vote for you, and, and, and then they will call their politicians and, and, and say that, okay, hey, help these guys, and, 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 and so on. Okay, so, so very, very much along the same lines as, as Lenka was already explaining in her presentation and, and, and talking now. And uh, I, I must add here that in, in this point that this decision in principle procedure that we have in the law was originally conceived in the, early, in the, the mid 80s for, for partially for this reason that we have a position for the political debate to take place on, to, to happen on the national level before any big commitments are made. Mm -hmm. And then once big financial commitments, and, and then once the political discussion is over, then the technical part can, can, can start. And this is important. But now when we come to very small reactors and very small reactors, the question arises that when are these decisions to be made on the national level? Okay. And, and the current system that we have has been written with very large projects in mind only. Mm -hmm. And now, now if some, some small town somewhere on the close to eastern border, for example, wants to build two or three 
small 24 megawatt reactors. Is this a decision that the government of the, of the Republic of Finland needs to make and the parliament needs to vote? Or could they make this decision by themselves in that town for their own benefits? So this, is, this is the question that I would like to put to our ministry colleague who has left. So, <laughs> <laughs> we we'll leave the topic for the, for the moment, but just, just so that you know that this kind of question does arise. But luckily, we have some uh, good politicians here running for the parliament, so perhaps they can uh, bring up this uh, this uh, topic at, at at some point. So, so basically, you say that people need to benefit, yes. and you're saying that uh, that if we can solve the economic and technological issues, but we need uh, need the communication. So, what other uh, social aspects are seen? Pretty many, I can see. So, <laughs> I just wanted to point out that. In licensing, it's very easy to get focused just on the licensing process as a whole and not on the total plant. So, at least uh, in many projects, you make compromises in the licensing process that you don't realize uh, the implications of later when you're trying to implement them. So, it's it's always important to have a balanced approach when you do the licensing and having a good decision-making tool in your favor, whether you would uh, argue against the requirement or give up uh, an argument on uh, a requirement. Um, from a standpoint of project success, that's all, that's very critical. And you sh very often, the licensing projects are run as a project as a, at, in and of themselves mm -hmm. with a budget, yeah. and you're trying to save money on that piece, uh, punting it to later phases of the project. And so you need, we just need to be very careful how that is handled during the licensing yeah. process. Yeah, we have. I think we've had some experiences of, of the licensing process taking some quite a long time here in Finland. But for the for the social issues that SMRs are facing, not not only in Finland but perhaps in, in other countries as, as well. So, Charles, you had your hand up. So. Yeah, I think uh, because uh, while in Finland it's not so much to say the public perception of nuclear, but in Denmark it obviously is. Uh, that also means that we have to uh, strategically we have to communicate us, ourselves as not that kind of nuclear. We had different kinds of nuclear. <laughs> because also they're just going to put us in the same booth that as conventional yeah. nuclear, and, and uh, then we will not uh, succeed in our yeah. endeavor. In, so, in Denmark. That would be a good way to kill the company, though. It would. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then we have to move to Finland. <laughs> yeah, the situation here, uh, I think. Uh, the acceptance of nuclear has uh, is increasing in Finland, so it's, it's a better situation perhaps than in Denmark. Okay, so uh, so I mentioned these three pillars: the social, and technological, and economic uh, uh, pillars. So, if the social aspect is uh, is what is required, and this actually what Johanny mentioned uh, that if a person benefits from the uh, project personally, then they are more likely to uh, approve it. <coughs> this actually re reminds me of a debate that, uh, that has been going, uh, going on for wind power in Finland. Mm -hmm. And some people are, are saying that they get certain physical symptoms out of uh, living in, uh, near, uh, near wind farms. But then there, I don't know if it's true, but there was a, a study that showed that <coughs> the likeliness of you getting the symptoms is correlated to the uh, uh, fact that are you actually getting financial compensation. <laughs> so if you're benefiting from the wind farm that is nearby your house, you don't get any symptoms, but if you're not benefiting it financially, then it's likely that you will get symptoms. So it's, it's a good uh, idea that we uh, have to include the communities. Okay, but to move on to the technological uh, pillar, that is, uh, 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 yeah, uh, because that also emphasizes that uh, the, one of the, the key things about small uh, modular reactors that is that you can actually uh, also uh, use some of the local construction people mm -hmm. and construction companies to do some of the, the construction. So it create, uh, and there will be more jobs there in, than, than uh, if, if what I say it came from a central, central facility, uh, and that means that more benefits uh, to the local community. If you move, if you want to do, would do that, then with the large ones. Yeah. So. So that more jobs. Build one. one uh, they will hire some, build some more, and then uh, <coughs> because the, the approval rate for uh, wind power in Denmark is, is very high. There are some some a few also with the symptoms you described, yeah. but, but uh, in general the, the public approves very much because it creates a lot of jobs and export. Um, so and everybody knows somebody who who works in the wind industry or works for somebody who works for the industry. So uh, in that way, why would you be against it? Okay. Um, 
Yeah, yeah, I agree on that point. But for the technology, I, I completely understand that this is design. Uh, it it depends on the design. That what is the main technological challenge <laughs> for for the implementation of of uh, SMRs? Because you know, as it was mentioned in in Eros presentation that or comment that certain designs are in different phases in their uh, life cycle, so to speak. So, so it might be a little bit early to say, but do you want to comment on that? that uh, what is the main technological challenge that we have to uh, overcome? Mr. Chen? In the technical problem, I, I think a small modular reactor already has, has a very good and enhanced safety, I think, than large reactor. So, uh, when I, uh, if I, if I, we, we, when we think of a severe extent, the, the, for example, smart, the, the, the probability of a severe extent in the smart is extremely low. Though in, only in case of only in case of the all of safety system are not operating, the the, the <coughs> severe extent occurs. So, but the, uh, that uh, those uh, those explanations the very <coughs> uh, strongly uh, related to the uh, economy. So the <coughs> in Korea, in the regulate, regulatory body, the request to the small module reactor as a, uh, the same uh, regulation in the large nuclear power plant. So we even though even though we have we have very extreme very low the possibility of a severe accident, too, we have to have we must have also must have the same fossil same the severe accident mitigation system <coughs> as large nuclear power plant. So that makes us the uh, high, higher the the cost. So mm -hmm. I think. It, so mm -hmm. I think to <coughs> to, de uh, to develop to, uh, to develop the SMR. So I think we have to the developer have to the uh, make effort for the technically. Uh, improvement, but the uh, regu regulator body, regulation body, also the, has changed their mind. Mm -hmm. I think for the uh, solar modular reactor. Uh, today, I have I have very good news from you. So the NRC has uh, NRC has uh, has the considering uh, is considering the reduce the EPG. I think it is very important for the small modular reactor. So mm, technical. Yeah. Reasons, yeah. Okay, so you think technical issues can be can be overcome if the regulator is uh, is sort of uh, with us on uh, on that? Okay, some other comments on technology, uh, Christopher. What we're working on the most is not, like I said, not the reactor and so on, because we have and kind of the base design is basically approved. But what we're really working on is making the civil structures simple, okay. repeatable, and low quantity and still qualified to seismic requirements. Okay. And we also optimize, instead of optimizing, no, instead of making the systems and building walls around them, we're building buildings and putting the systems in the buildings to absolutely minimize the amount of safety class one, seismic category one concrete. And that's been difficult, but it's not impossible, and it's, uh, changing the whole schedule, everything, the labor force, the, the cost, everything changes. Okay. So minimizing safety class one, you know, expensive. Well, not uh, making it so components. little that it's not safe. Well, it was basically what Johanny said. You put the minimum passive amount of safety functions in the safety class defense level as possible without support systems, active support systems. Yeah. And you don't put anything in that structure that doesn't belong there. Okay. Even if it maybe some person thinks it should be there because it would be a shorter pipe or something, you go, no, that's not what we're optimizing. We're not optimizing piping because we know how to do that. It's okay. concrete that is the problem. Yeah. And how so, do you see uh, then as, as reactor vendors that, the, do you see it as an issue that we are not able, at least in, in the larger uh, plants, we are not able to use uh, like standard industrial components in lower lower safety classes. Let's say we have a, a valve or, or a pump that is exactly the same that is being used, let's say, in the oil or gas industry. But we cannot use that because we have to license it to be able to be, um, for it to be used in a nuclear power facility. 
So do you see this as, a, as an issue or something that we could achieve more uh, in, in, in SMRs? Do you see it as a challenge? Yeah, yeah. Something yeah, sorry. Continue. So for this, this is where smaller size really helps you because the smaller size results in smaller valve sizes. And so you can uh, ease, more easily and cheaply procure smaller valves instead of giant valves. Uh, everything that we're procuring is off the shelf from catalogs with an extra dedication and testing program. Right. Okay. Instead of having to pay a, a supplier m lots of money to develop a larger valve of that type, like we did in the past. All our okay. valves were outside of the catalog. So we, we always had to like buy the special stuff. Now we can buy that one, you know, and so th then you can go in and pre-select vendors or specific valves. You can pre-determine, before you even start designing the systems, you can go, you can only pick small, big, medium. Like you have three valves to pick from, you have three heat exchangers to pick from, mm -hmm. you have high big sizes to pick from. You can make it really simple. Okay. So small right. is, uh, is beautiful. You want to <laughs> yeah, but my friend Christer here was still referring to some uh, special dedication then which he needs to do because he has high pressure, high temperature. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I was aiming at low pressure, low temperature, and I'm really hoping that I could actually use, for example, in my reactor circuit standard heat exchangers mm -hmm. from yeah, the true. market. And, and uh, this will take some debate with, with my regulator colleagues that, that how are we going to qualify them for you know, in, in order to reach an acceptable level of safety regarding <coughs> leakages from one side to the next. Yeah. It, I think it, it, at, at this point of the conversation it needs to be uh, mentioned that it, it is not a competition that whose design is the best, so so let's not fight on, on that. No, no, I think no, no, we no, had, no, uh, no, but you, you need to understand yeah, that for different course. conditions you have different yeah. requirements yes. and you have also different opportunities. That is, the, that is, that is true, but... Uh, uh, as far as of my knowledge, the EPC contract is not going to be signed today, or if it is, I'm going to be really surprised. So, but we're here to discuss SMRs in in in, in general. But that, but that was an interesting point that that you know pressure and then the, then the size uh, size question. But yeah. Uh, I think we also focus sometimes too much on innovations in the reactor system itself, which is important, but there's also innovations to be had and technologies that could be um, bettered in the secondary system yes. of the plant as well, especially if we're looking at diverse <coughs> applications and having a combined heat and power plant, for example, because in order to be very viable on the market, you want this plant to be able to instantaneously switch from heat production to electricity production, for example. So having some innovations on that secondary side, I think is the next barrier that we're pursuing um, and also working with the Idaho National Laboratory on hybrid energy systems and being able to work with the grid better than nuclear okay. plants do today. Cool. All right, Mr. Chen, you, uh, you mentioned in your speech uh, the licensing part and, and Rose, you mentioned it uh, as well, and I think that's one of the main questions for this panel is that, because I see two big, big issues for, for, for threats, for game changers or showstoppers for SMRs, and one is the cost, and, and that is dependent on licensing, and the second is, is the social acceptance, basically a not in my backyard problem. And to dig in into this first one, the cost and, and, and hence the licensing from there, how do you see that we can overcome this risk of SMRs needing like country specific designs or some changes? Because I see that as, uh, as sort of destroying your serial production in, in, in your factory. If, if one uh, regulator or utility wants a bad year, one, another one wants another redundancy or something like this. So how can we overcome this? I think this is you know, the biggest question for this panel is, is this. How can we overcome this risk? Anybody? Okay. I'll try. I'm not a <laughs> regulatory expert by any means. But uh, in Canada, we have a regulatory system which is, uh, which is principles-based. So uh, basically, the regulator is calling upon the vendor uh, or the operator to prove that the design is safe. Okay. And so our job is to do that. We prove it's safe. And if we do, then we get a license. And if we don't, then we don't get a license. So that basic fundamental reality of regulation, if that 
would be, if that could possibly be the norm internationally. It's not the norm today. Yeah. That's not the way all regulatory systems work for the nuclear power industry. Uh, and uh, so if that could somehow, if that crazy notion, that controversial idea could spread yeah. to other countries, then, uh, then maybe we have a chance. <coughs> okay. Any uh, other uh, pathways forward, Krishna? Well, there's a way to at least mitigate the risk. You can never, I think, make it zero. Like, you can never, I don't think you can ever go in, well, in certain cases you can, but to every country with exactly the same design. First of all, the design is on the ground, so the site conditions changes everywhere. So that's one thing. But in terms of how you develop your safety case, if you use a, uh, if you, uh, we've come to the conclusion through many trials, <laughs> is that if you use the IEA system, most countries have a translation, or you can develop a translation table to most countries, including the US, which doesn't use it as a basic system, but Canada uses it, UK uses it, Finland. And most of the developing nations understand IEEA because they're participating in the IEEA. So if you start with IEEA and develop your decision-making tree on how it's safe to classify and how to design your system and components and structures, uh, at least then you have a transparent decision-making uh, process that you can get approval for in, in advance. And then if you have detailed comments on it, it uh, on a specific question, you can go back to this is what we did. Okay. So you can set that up yeah. as design rules. Or so use IAEA uh, as but also design basis. Clear design rules. Okay. All right. right, right. I fully agree with you, first of all, on, on this. And I'd like to take it off on from there, because at least in our case, or, or in the case in our, our country, the, the long time that has been consumed has has, has gone into the, the uh, repeated oversight of repeated uh, and, and repeated manufacturing and installation activities. So repeating is bad, and also too, let's say, oversight of too petty de detail during the actual implementation is bad. And, and this is where the harmonization is difficult. It's not difficult on the high level. It's not difficult on the high level at all. I mean, everybody follow, more or less follows the same de de defense in depth ideas. But uh, in, in the actual implementation level, there are still plenty of national technical standards which you need to follow. And these are different in every country because they are they also are a way of protecting your domestic industry. So, so mm -hmm. linking this generic design and the generic safety case for which you have an approval to the national standards so, so that you have minimal friction at the interface might help. I don't think it's, a, it's completely realistic to get out, get rid of these national standards, especially in the nuclear safety classified components, but at, at least on the EU level, we have had some standardization on, on pressure equipment, for example, which is why I would like to use these yeah. heat exchangers from the market, which already have a certificate according to the pressure equipment directive. Okay. All right. Let's, for this licensing uh, question at risk, let's paint a picture that you're the reactor vendor. Okay. You are. <laughs> and you want to sell your reactor to three potential customers in different countries in, in, in Europe. And you're thinking about this risk that, okay, are they, is the regulator going to require something, a magic trick from us in two years, which I'm not seeing uh, today? If you are in that situation, when you have these three countries, I think, what is the pathway there to mitigate this risk? Not to speak of 27 EU countries, but just three. How to overcome it? Or is this a secret trick that you don't want to reveal to your attorneys? <laughs> I can say something. Yeah. I mean, what, uh, I would look at their past performance. How, uh, if they have, uh, how have they dealt uh, with advanced, uh, all these advanced before? Uh, if there is any, uh, um, obviously. Okay. Um, so. The, so you sort of see, uh, you know, how has the regulator behaved in yeah. the past? Yeah. Okay. It's one way. All right. Any other uh, ideas? I think what's worked for us is having close and continuous communication with the regulator. And so I think if the mechanisms for that were in place um, to have that pre-application process of continually um, working with the regulator, educating <coughs> them, learning from them what requirements you need, then that's that's what makes the process successful. In the okay. Way. So. You need to. You would need to collaborate with the national, uh, each national regulator to see if it's 
feasible to, to uh, have your design sort of certified? Is that the point? Not feasible necessarily, but that you are preparing your application in the correct manner, that it will be acceptable to them so that you don't hit those speed bumps in the, okay. in the actual process. All right, Christian. I would uh, recommend also focusing on the how instead of the exactly what it ended up being in every country. Like, uh, set out the process for qualification, but not all the details of qualification in your regulatory framework. Because if you go into details and you have to change the supplier because someone went bankrupt, you're sitting with a license that has to change. But if you're going to follow the same process because you have to change the supplier and you're getting a qualified product, it doesn't really matter if you can make the function work. Right? Okay. So stay on that level. Don't go down to details and don't specify valve types, concrete types, specify process. Okay. And qualification process. To get some kind of a pre approval from the or a preliminary safety yeah. assessment from the And then they can always you can always come back and look, did you follow your process? Yeah, this should be okay. Or no, you didn't, you skipped this step. <coughs> okay. To, to the end. Yeah. All right. Now if we uh, if we change the roles a little bit uh, from what being a reactor vendor or still being a reactor vendor, but looking at the situation from the other side is that what is that if you had like a wish or like three wishes uh, for the key stakeholders, let's say here in Finland, be it the ministry or the regulator or the nuclear industry or the politicians, what would it be? <clears throat> what do you? What is that you need from uh, from uh, from us in a sense to uh, to be successful? Yeah, uh, would you not consider the ratepayer uh, as one of the key stakeholders? I mean, are the, the rate payer, the people that actually oh, yeah. use electricity? <coughs> of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a number so, of so them, of course. I would have a wish for them. Yeah. And that is that they develop some minimal level of education of what energy is and where it comes from okay. and what nuclear power, <laughs> uh, what, how nuclear power works. Uh, just on the most basic level, we're not asking them to become nuclear physicists. Okay. But, uh, and I think, I mean, Finland is exceptional in the sense that there seems to be a, a high degree of education, and, but uh, many other places are not like that. Um, education is the, the, I mean, this goes back to the social question yeah. too. It's the biggest single barrier I think that we have. Most people don't know anything about nuclear power, so that's why they're afraid of it. And they don't know people from the nuclear power industry. Yeah, That's our fault. We are not communicating with them or interfacing with, with them enough on a personal level. I think we need to do a lot more of that as an industry. Um, but And so that's how the education process happens with a community or okay. a society. So we need education, okay. What else, some more wishes? Um, what I, oh. ahead, yeah, <laughs> okay, uh, what I would need, uh, would like <laughs> to see is actually that, uh, because Finland has a unique position in that it has a positive uh, public uh, pro-nuclear. Uh, there's a grow. There will be a growing market in Eastern Europe where Finnish companies can move in uh, with some of the vendors who are here or others. <coughs> so, from my point of view, what could, what would be, what I would wish for is that the Finnish government uh, goes in and say we we want to push for this technology and develop some of the suppliers and, and some of the companies that are associated with it. Um, even though you may not have a vendor yourself, a uh, vendor company, then you can still uh, still a lot of uh, uh, say uh, companies around that that uh, can make a lot of money uh, and uh, what do you say uh, create jobs and export. Um, so, but the politician has to push push for it and say we want ten percent of the district heat in, in Helsinki being from his mass or something in in twenty thirty or twenty thirty five. Something like that, and then uh, maybe even subsidize it uh, in the beginning and say, like, we guarantee that the first uh, 8,000 full hours of production is at a certain price. That's what, how they did in the wind industry. Yeah. So, and as, uh, a lot of the policies can actually be, be inspired from the wind uh, power industry. Uh, okay, so I think that wish for the politicians, maybe we get an answer in the next uh, political panel because we have uh, some good guys here to answer that wish. Uh, anything else before we uh, 
give the floor to the politicians? Yes, Johan. Yes, a, a wish from me would be that uh, that our authorities, the ministry, especially, would move quickly in, in in order to start preparing for the for the changes in legislation because the in the aviation industry. I, I think the, the rules of the FAA, the, the US a, a, aviation re regulator, are followed more or less globally because the, the US aircraft industry dominated the passenger aircraft development in the early, when, at the times when, when, when they were becoming very common, so in, in, the, in the 60s and 70s. So everybody else had to follow. And, and now, if we want to harmonize, for example, in Europe, the, uh, the, the playing field for the, for the SMRs, those who implement them first will get the, the best say on how they will be applied. So we should move quickly, much more quickly than Rauli was en 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 envisioning. So to actually build something and see how, how it comes out and, and, and then everybody else can copy that. Okay, just to add to that, um, uh, you shouldn't necessarily focus on creating a pan-European uh, licensing system because that would not be possible, but you could focus on creating a coalition of the willing that would actually uh, join it, uh, because then by creating the critical mass, others would join in later. So, okay. uh, just to add. Joint forces. A system where you can have an inroad if you already have a license. Like, how can you apply for a license in a country if you come with a license from somewhere? Maybe not all countries match, but some type of... Mm -hmm. So the same thing is if the uh, principal well, reactor is, is, uh, is approved, then you right. uh, can can cut that part out. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. you spend five hundred million or something uh, somewhere, and do you want to spend another five hundred million somewhere else to do exactly the same no. thing over again? Not many want to do no. that. <laughs> okay. Uh, there's a question from the audience. Yeah, I'm five dollars from Estonia again. Uh, uh, what I wanted to point out is that. Um, it was yesterday at VDD, and uh, they started the first reactor here in, in uh, Finland in 1962. It was 21 for years only after after uh, the Chicago fire. So, and it, which means that Finland at the time really, really con contributed to, to nuclear research. So, uh, and Finland, I know, has pretty decent uh, uh, energy R and D. Uh, financing available, so I'm um, I'm I'm hoping that I believe that uh, Villa or um, uh, uh, Rauli, sorry, uh, also got some share of that. So, but nevertheless, um, researching this opportunity opportunity much more seriously, I would I would I would assume that Finland would do that and spend some money on, on how to how to reach those goals. I, I, this is incredibly good valuable that Fortum is doing that, and it is absolutely necessary. But uh, from that report, there should be further steps forward uh, to, to make a more, more, much more clear value proposition to, to consumers. And, and uh, this is the way to go, uh, because there has to be this value proposition to consumers. So what I'm saying is that there should be so much more financing on research and development from Finland that is already benefiting and has nuclear know-how. And that would be um, ah, very likely that the, the first place to, to start with uh, combined heat and, and electricity production. If not, Canada is doing it first. We'll see. So on. more nuclear uh, research is, uh, and studies are needed. So perhaps this study by Think and uh, and the study by VTT are just a First ones in the in a series of studies of leading to uh, construction at, at some point. Okay, we're uh, almost running out of time. Unfortunately, I have so many uh, other questions for the uh, vendors as well. But I think we have time for one or two questions from the audience. Yeah. So my name is Matt Ingersoll. I'm a student from the U.S. and it seems like you all identify that the social kind of acceptance of nuclear energy is one of the main kind of potential barriers for all of your technologies. And I was wondering if any of you, if any of your organizations have plans to change public opinion or to collaborate with other organizations to change public opinion. Because it's such an important issue, right? Like, if it was a technical issue, I would assume that a company would um, dedicate like a whole uh, section of the company to that issue. Um, but although it isn't 
kind of a, a typical barrier that you might think of in technology that's just as important? I can okay. start on that since it's my job. <laughs> um, and that's actually the first point is I, before coming to New Scale three years ago, um, I was looking for a job with my title in the nuclear industry and it didn't exist. There's not, there's usually not in, there's, you'll have the marketing department, business department, but there's not usually one person that's solely responsible for public engagement and external relations. And so having even just a person dedicated to it helps. And some smaller companies don't have the resources for that, but being mindful of that, that it should be someone's responsibility is a first step. Um, we're doing a few things at NewScale. We contribute um, to various organizations to help us with the social advocacy because I don't think that we can do it ourselves. Um, we partner with other organizations, so we partnered with Terrestrial in the past on going to clean energy conferences, for example, so I think that collaboration is necessary. Um, and then a last piece that we're doing is that we're actually training our internal employees to become ambassadors of the company and to go out and speak on behalf of the company, um, either at local clubs or you know even going to universities um, or different types of conferences so that we do get as many people out there as possible because I think that most people aren't necessarily pro or against nuclear, they just have a lot of questions and they've never really met someone working in nuclear to ask them if they don't live in a nuclear community. So, so that's been our, our biggest engagement piece is to really not be afraid to get out there. Okay. Yeah, um, you had a comment on that? Um, we do the same in Denmark. We don't have, we're not uh, so big that we can uh, one <laughs> with your responsibility uh, alone. But yeah, we do uh, do the same. Everybody's up uh, talking to, to the public, to the politicians. Uh, we also try to press in the EU, uh, but uh, in order to, to uh, get through. But but yeah, and don't also all in the uh, do as much speak as we can, and let, uh, also all the companies are actually talking about it. So uh, giving talks. Okay. The word. Oh, can I? just a quick comment. What Max is describing is a task that is so monumentally huge. Uh, it's almost as big as building and licensing a nuclear power plant itself. <laughs> You're talking about re-educating an entire uh, society that has an idea in their heads, uh, which is it's not a it's not a data based idea. It's a faith based idea which is that nuclear power is dangerous. So what you have to do is you have to reverse that. It's very difficult to do. Uh, try telling a, a religious person that God doesn't exist. You can't do it. So uh, I think that the first thing we can do as, a, as, a, as an industry sector is just understand the, the, the massive, massive nature of the task that you're describing. It's something we have to do, absolutely, uh, but it is... It is a huge task, and it deserves the, the appropriate fraction of our resources to be able to try to carry it out. Do you see it as something that you can benefit from collaborating with, let's say, NGOs that are pro-nuclear? Yes, I, absolutely. I've seen this. Uh, there's a big change in Finland compared to 10 years ago, and I, I think it's mainly because of the NGOs being our sort of loudspeaker to the, to the uh, society for the benefits of nuclear. Well, so they have more are you seeing something else, uh, they something have, similar? Yeah, they have, well, they have more credibility because they're, they're a level of remove away from the industry. Yeah. So, we, yeah, we do do that. And also because, well, they're a resource. So we, we, we don't have to have that as an internal resource. Eventually, we will all have to. Uh, but, yeah, so we... we Work with them. I say it sounds, yeah. seems like you guys are sort of sort of talking about the work we do here. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, when, I, when I got into this about, about three years ago, uh, there there wasn't a strong uh, push. So there wasn't a push, or even really a strong desire from a lot of the the players in the industry at that time to do this kind of public engagement. And uh, in that time. I've seen that shift dramatically to the point where um, I, I don't have to call uh, folks at the national labs anymore. They call me and say, hey, Eric, can you come and do your communications training here? Um, same thing with you know chapters of the American Nuclear Society or the North American Young Generation of Nuclear. They call me and say, wow, you know, we, we really, we're, I think we're overdue for an advocacy training about now. We gotta get one in here. Um, so the, the 
the, the heightened awareness over the last couple of years has been incredible um, because like Canon and, and Lenka are saying, this, this is of huge importance and, uh, and it's a monumental task. And there's, there's not a lot of funding in it right now, um, and, but at least we're, we're gaining a lot more volunteer hours. Um, our volunteer group just this year has, has grown from an active group of about 10 to now about 50 people that are actively working on various projects, which is awesome. And it's honestly, it's too much for me to even manage properly. So I'm like trying to get volunteers to manage other volunteers. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, man, we need some more full-time staff people. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's what I'll say about okay. that. So basically the idea is that we all need to engage in this uh, debate and to uh, spread the word of, uh, of nuclear. But I think uh, our time is pretty much up uh, at the moment. It's, uh, it's been a huge pleasure of having all of you here, and I hope that we can continue the discussion on the, on the hallway in, in just a bit. And now we will give the stage to the politicians. So, to our panelists.